Hello and welcome to Complimentary Colors. Uh, it's a special day today because I'm joined with you, the entire MCG interior design studio here. All of the interior designers are here, so I'm with Kara Rood. Hello. Casey Key. Hi, hello. And our special guest, Ashley Gillian. Hello. All right. Are you ladies <laughs> excited to talk about what we're going to talk about today? Yes. Always. Intimidated, always. but ready. All right. Well, let's dive into neurodiversity. First, though, I would like to give a disclaimer. One, it's a very big topic, so I think it will split split some of these conversations up into a couple episodes because um, it can definitely fall into different sectors of which we do inside of our office, like transportation, healthcare, education, mm -hmm. not just the workforce. Um, but today I think we're going to touch a little bit on how it kind of interacts with us personally and what we feel neurodiversity is and how we can better it in our designs. We acknowledge that neurodiversity encompasses a broad range of conditions, some of which may be unresponsive to design solutions. Addressing the needs of neurodiverse individuals should involve a review of human resource policies, technology solutions, building operations, and other factors. We do not guarantee that any design solutions we discuss today with you can achieve specific outcomes for individual users. We are just sharing insights, experiences that mm -hmm. we've heard and seen through our research, and we're excited to start today. So, ladies, I'm gonna ask you a question. What does neurodiversity mean to you personally? And uh, Casey, I'm gonna start with you. I'm ready. Okay. What does it mean to you personally? So I forced myself not to look it up so that I could define it, like I said previously. Um, <laughs> and I've said that it means accounting for all brains and all personalities rather than accepting normal or mm. normal in quotation marks or the understood majority, again, in quotation marks, because my personal experience has told me that nine out of 10 people have something that falls into the category of neurodiversity so really the outlier should mm. be the one percent that we have accepted as quote-unquote normal and maybe that normal has been defined by cinema or Absolutely. advertisement yes. or because i would say that now that we're also hyperly connected that's been broken down oh too. my gosh yeah. So. yeah kara how about you what is what does neurodiversity mean to you personally um <laughs> I'm like, let me start at my childhood. No, <laughs> but I think I, I did. I reflected all the way back. Like, what did it mean then? Because, you know, 30 years ago growing up, um, anyone that was not that quotation normal, there was, they were called just special needs. Oh, they have special needs and just kind of all lumped together, yep. you know, and I have, um, or had a aunt that, um, had a neuro disease and um, we would go and we would see her. She had cerebral palsy and we'd see her in the place that she stayed. And as a child, I think I was like five or six at the time, you know, I think I viewed neurodiversity as fear-based just because I, I didn't understand it mm -hmm. at that time. And then kind of seeing as, you know, it's worked into our career's work um, over the time, it's just broadened, you know, and if anything, it's become now the opposite of that view that I started it's a really with. really good point. And it's become more acceptance and more freedom to ask for things you need. That's a really good, that's a really good personal aspect on it. Um, Ashley, what about you? What do you got? Actually, kind of the same thing, thinking back to my childhood. Um, I feel like it's kind of, you feel like an other, you know, you don't <laughs> feel like you're part of the norm. You feel like you're just kind of the weird kid out there and um, you know going back to my personal experience um, being diagnosed with ADD when I was in first grade um, you know it, it's always been a little bit of you just feel like you have to work harder than the normal mm -hmm. person than the average person but uh, Carrie good point as you pointed out like we're getting so much more insight with the public on you know with social media on like actually more, pe more and more people are you know, neurodivergent than we think. So. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And because I've <laughs> I've been nerding out on this topic probably since 2018, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it has evolved for me personally too because now that I've been a little bit more aware of my surroundings and my family and friends, I've found that neurodiversity to me personally is almost finding those individuals that can do things differently better 
than me, mm-hmm. like pattern recognition, mm-hmm. details, um, math, hmm. math. Right. That's a big one. I mean, I'm sorry. Rain <laughs> Man came to mind when I was yes. like, I remember being like jealous on the phone book scene. I was like, I want to know how to do that. Granted, the psyche, I was like 11, you know, and I was like, still, that's dope. You know, that's really funny. Well, when I was trying to find a neutral definition to neurodiversity to start, it was kind of a nice blend of what everybody has been saying. Um, Scientifically, they say that neurodiversity is an approach to education and ability that supports the fact that various neurological conditions are the effect of normal changes and variations in the human genome. Mm -hmm. So that's um, ADHD. So I don't know, where did that ADD turn into ADHD? That's a good question. I'm not (laughs) sure because, you know, I grew up in the the 90s, you know, as a kid, it was always ADD, attention deficit disorder, and then it became ADHD, I guess, that they did discover that there's two kinds of ADHD. I was going to say, there are two different Ah. types. Because there's the inattentive and the more, like, hyperactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it used yep. to be autism, and now there's a broad autism spectrum. Down syndrome. So true. And autism Asperger's, was the next yeah. one on the list, um, along with um, just other types of like neurological disorders, similar to your aunt mm-hmm. that you were talking about. Um, but other than that, when I, when you research how neurodiversity impacts the interior spaces, it comes up with a, a different kind of definition, and it might be just a softer definition. Um, because we are realizing how many people around us are neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. And it's just basically saying that research highlights that neurodiversity is not defined by a deficiency in comprehension, but rather a difference in how people process information. Mm -hmm. Which I was like, that's perfect. It is Mm -hmm. a difference in the way people process information. There we go. We're all (laughs) all on some different level of that. So I thought that was really interesting. And then there were um, a couple key terms that I wanted to go over <clears throat> so that we can lay some, some playing fields for the next following questions I have for you. And some of those key terms are one that we've used before, neurodiverse, neurodiverse, referring to the group of people with a variety of neurological conditions. So that's mm-hmm. neurodiverse. Neurodivergent is individuals who think and process information in a different way than norms of particular culture. So we have neurodiverse and neurodivergent, Mm -hmm. okay? And then we have neurotypical. Neurotypical are individuals who think and process information in ways that are typical to their culture. I'm glad they added the caveat of culture. Culture. Exactly, that's a really good point. And then we have, within both of those sectors, there are hypersensitive and hypersensitive individuals are those who can easily experience sensory overload Mm. or overstimulation and then we have hyposensitive and those are individuals who have a decreased ability to experience sensory stimulation Mm -hmm. so i wanted to throw those ones out there so that when we talk about some of these next questions i'm sure some of these will come up so when we're reading all this research and we see hypo versus hyper like, mm-hmm. oh, it's studying in a cafe Just, or the library. Like, what am, what am I? Um, so with that being said, I wanted to ask you guys, what was the first time you heard of neurodiversity in research? College. I mean, College. yeah, I would say it was... Um, it was very specific, though. It wasn't like this thread that they wove through all of the courses. It was specific to a studio about designing for the elderly and, you know, uh, which then kind of led into universal design. Oh, like um, dementia. Right. And Alzheimer's. then um, how we affect that in color theory, mm-hmm. affecting their blood pressure, but then also like patterning affecting vertigo. So vertigo was always that like, you know, the kicker that they were like ever, you know, mm-hmm. the eyesight. So I was, I was trying to think how that would even apply here because they were hyper sensitive, mm-hmm. you know, to the patterning. And so we needed to calm that down. And then it, really the same thing where, um, color theory, like it just needed to be more calm, but then contrasting cause they were losing that ability to see contrast as easily. 
it's almost like as a baby and then as an mm-hmm. L we return to that kind of black and white need high contrast. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think you're right on the typical neuroscience from the scientific realm really focused on that neurodiverse, the ones that had the neurological conditions more. Mm-hmm. Um, and typically many of those almost 99.9% are hypersensitive. Interesting. So they almost went hand in hand. Interesting. Which is interesting, yeah. Yeah, but I would say besides that, it really didn't hit home until you started studying for your uh, uh, healthcare test. <laughs> yeah. And then it started coming like, into my life. Know? Did yeah, you know? Did you know this? So you, you know would that? be my most recent. <laughs> You're such a great oh, conduit for information. So <laughs> Casey, what about you? Uh, I probably didn't hear the term in a, a formal sense until after university. Mm-hmm. And specifically, I remember hearing at ILFI. I love I, yes. Uh, for those who don't know, the in- Institute for Living Futures, International Living Futures Institute. There, there it is. There you go. I had to think about it. <laughs> Those acronyms. I just know it as I- I love I. <laughs> uh, for the <laughs> So uh, that was probably the first time I heard it in a formal setting. Um, I had always grown up around now being able to label neurodiverse people. And uh, a lot of people in my family have... Uh, aspects to their personality that could be categorized as neurodiverse but uh, I was taught from a very early age that um, it doesn't matter like how you learn um, Mm -hmm. or you know at what rate you learn or uh, how you intake the world that you do in your own way and that's totally fine and you do it at your pace and that's good and beautiful and right so I was introduced to that concept young but it's couldn't have put beautiful. a label on it until later in life. That's really cool when you're like, oh, I knew that, mm-hmm. but I didn't know it in that sense. It was almost shocking to hear that that's <laughs> Intuitively, something. Intuitively. Yeah. Know. It was like, why, why isn't this? Why don't people think about that? Yeah. It's like, way. you don't really have to define kindness. You just know that someone's kind. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, oh, that means kindness. Unless it's kind you of how have an experienced kindness. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, that's mm-hmm. a good point. So good point. Valid. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Ashley, what do you got? Um, well, I was ADD, so I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say I honestly. Oh, <laughs> and mic drop. <laughs> that was a good one. I honestly um, don't know that I've actually heard the term. Um, and maybe I had and it just didn't because I didn't I process things differently. <laughs> but, um, you know, until more recently, I would. Scrolling through Instagram, there's that funny video of um, Parks and Rec that don't be suspicious. You know? Don't be suspicious. <laughs> don't be suspicious. And it talked about like neurodivergent brains trying to leave a party. And I was like, God, that's me. And I was like, so then yeah. I had to Google the word. I was like, oh, okay, this is what I, have, you know, or what I've dealt with a lot of my life. So um, yeah, it's just kind of in recent. And I do recall uh, in university studying about mm. the, you know, the different contrasting color yellows for, you know nursing homes and things mm-hmm. the high contrast and mm-hmm. so I I've heard all of that but I didn't right. put it all together into like neo neurodivergent so yeah it's pretty yeah. interesting I, do I feel like it's pretty it's a pretty new umbrella yeah. it is for the majority I was just gonna say like I I'm with Kara with like learning some of that stuff mm-hmm. almost because I minored in psychology too so there was a little bit of an overlap between what my interior design studies were in the psychology studies, but it really wasn't until like 2019 mm-hmm. um, when I was studying for that healthcare test and had just passed the well building institute mm-hmm. test because the healthcare one goes very specifically into those neurodiverse conditions, yes. right? And focusing on how- And not we all can, the features of well. Yeah, but yeah. then well was really touching on all of the other neurodivergent things that are so common but never were, were labeled. Like actually, mm-hmm. just like you were mm-hmm. saying, it's like, oh, that's why that intuitively felt good to that person. Now we just have a scientific reason why and now can design in a scientific way to give people choice and control of what they do during the day. Mm-hmm. So it really was in that 18, 19 study mindset time frame of my, my life where um, right before the pandemic. And then I think the pandemic also really oh, shed light on onto- like the common... <laughs> The public, you know, outside the profession, I think Mm -hmm. there was, they, they couldn't define it. It's funny because I'm starting to think a little bit more about, um, remember right when Starbucks really started to take off. And I think I was in Portland during this time. Mm -hmm. So like being in the Northwest, I just remember, and everyone couldn't define that spatial quality besides naming the place. 
you know, it's like a Starbucks lobby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they would it's all. So true. They would all just use it as this reference. And I so wanted just, to feel like Starbucks. Okay. Right. And so now, but people are like, you know, they can define it in other ways about mm-hmm. like, you know, these comforts of home. They could start to talk about like, oh, no, ergonomics is now widely used by the public. Things mm-hmm. like that were mm-hmm. uh, the light quality. So I do feel like the more information we've been given and shared, you know, socially that now we could define better. Yeah. Kudos to Starbucks, mm-hmm. though, for exactly starting that kind of why does that feel good? Right. They really did a good job putting that. Going outside of home to feel like home. Yes. Third yeah. place. Yeah. The third yeah. place. Trust yes. me, I took the, I worked there. So they brainwash you and they give <laughs> you all these videos. That. Oh. Yeah. Third place. Oh. Third place. Oh. Anyway, place. Well, then they coined it. Good job. <laughs> I mean, it's not unique to them. The Greeks started it. Just saying. <clears throat> oh. Oh, okay, Casey. <laughs> How did the Greeks start it? I'm curious now. Oh, well, no, that's very off topic. That'll be another. <laughs> the third place coming to a podcast. We're coming to just we're just we're we are <laughs> coming to a podcast to you and learn why the Starbucks feels so important. <laughs> we will. We'll, co- we'll come back to Starbucks. Yeah. Um, well, on that note, there was some kind of interesting information that I found um, for everybody that loves the statistics out there. Um, and there's a report developed by HOK. And HOK is a a big design company that I love and follow, um, similar to what Gensler does with their Think Lab, but they have um, a research department <clears throat> and they've put a lot of effort into researching uh, new ad- neurodiversity in the workforce and healthcare and transportation, a lot of different sectors. And so they found that 20% of employees are neurodivergent. Mm-hmm. Period. <laughs> and twenty percent. I was gonna say that's it. Well, uh-huh. see, caveat. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And now remember, there is neurodivergent and neurodiverse. Mm. There you go. Got okay. Mm-hmm. So neurodivergent twenty percent, and then the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics nineteen point three percent are neurodiverse. So that means forty percent of our population are either neurodiverse or neurodivergent. So that means only 60% are neurotypical. Mm. That's almost an even 50-50. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was really interesting. I wanted, wanted to share that. But then within those settings, there was those two spectrums of the hypo and the hypersensitive. So hyper versus hypo um, in any given environment Hypersensitive people have difficulty seeing, hearing, or feeling acute sensory detail. Okay. And then others prefer to be stimulated and need stimuli to process the sensory information. So this was kind of the example of, uh, for example, Kara, where, where did you study in college? Where did I, like the physical place, not the Where did you go to geographical. study? Um, in my studio, mostly. In your studio? Did yeah. you listen to music? Oh, yeah. Okay. The so it wasn't time. quiet. You were no. in your home. I love that she's typecasting me because she's like, oh, she's going to be hypo for a show. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just asking. Yes. I like to be around a lot of people, a lot of things happening. Mm. I actually went to the uh, public library also uh-huh. just because I liked the energy around me, if I went home and was like in solitude, I'd get distracted or fall asleep. Interesting. Yeah. So I was the opposite in a way because I liked the, I didn't like the library because it wasn't activated enough. Mm. So it's probably just a difference between our library. So I find myself at Starbucks. Oh, random, random. Um, But then I would always be listening to music too. So it was like, I needed the physical stimulation, but I needed to zone out the mm. background noise so I wouldn't mm-hmm. get easily distracted uh, to focus. And Ashley, I think you always surprised me with saying, oh, yeah, I listened to that podcast while I did work. And I was like, God, I would just derail myself. Like, I cannot listen to a podcast and listen to my own internal monologue of what I'm supposed <laughs> to be doing from a day to day. So in, in school, where did you study? Um, usually back at my my dorm or my you know apartment, um, I think kind of being more sensitive to stimuli, you know, it was like distracting being at the library. But uh-huh. it was people doing. So, um, you know, it was harder to focus. So actually listening to music, you know, in my apartment was probably So no best. physical stimuli, just mental stimuli. Exactly. And then Casey, what about you? Where'd you study? Uh, it changed. So I, for 
our audience. I grew up homeschooled uh, K through 12, which is a very different world to live in, especially uh, when you learn to study and take courses and do all of that solo dolo. Like I was by myself. I had my brothers around until high school. And then high school was just me and my mom. And so when I first went to university, studying was um, by myself in my room, my door closed. So like, please don't distract me because like, I don't <laughs> Do know how me. to deal with you until like I got used to the, like I could still never study with friends at the table, but I went from like, I need a quiet room and like maybe music in the background to I like to be out and about and like in a coffee shop um, with music or a podcast in my ear. So it, it changed, which is very weird for me. See, like there was definitely like, transition periods of when I realized the way I had learned to like study and work wasn't working anymore. So I had to like figure out if I was a library girly or if I was a student hall girly or if I was, you know, a student lobby girly. And like it ended up being coffee shops away from people that I would talk to, but yet around stimuli. Yeah, yeah. Around yeah. energy. Yeah. So where I was going with that is that studying for an exam can be just as stressful as some of the work we do day to day in our careers. Yeah. And so you've got two coffee shop girls with background noise mm -hmm. and then two different, well, you, you did the library too. So, but more of the like, um, music and quiet spaces. Um, and so the office scenario gives a lot of those similar aspects to where we can choose where we're going to do that work. Depending on the office. Depending on the mm -hmm. office. And so that's what they're finding is that even if you're neurotypical, you still are either hypo or hyper. So designing for neurodiversity is an A plus for everybody. It's like a home run. Mm -hmm. So when you learned about neurodiversity, um, where, where did you see yourself validating what you had designed or thinking differently about what you can design in the future. Carol, I'm going to start with you. Um, I think where I've seen it is that I used to try to get very detailed in the um, different types of spaces because mm -hmm. I always knew like autonomy and choice were very important. You know, that's always been like a backbone of what interior design is. Um, but I think I used to try to overdo the built-ins and overdo, like, I'm going to solve every problem <laughs> instead of now I try to make it as like flexible for me is like almost like a room that could be, you know, changed by someone that walked in that had never been there before. Mm -hmm. And I think before it was like, let me do all the work for you, which in turn kind of pigeonholes you in technology of the time mm, you know yeah. or in the way people even function socially or you must look at this wall if you want a projector it's like right like oh, i mean yeah, how many amazing conference rooms did mm -hmm. i design early in my career and now everyone wants like a to write on place. every wall <laughs> right or they you know have flex spaces and mm -hmm. something that's more informal we've all learned gets more inner you know information out of a group Rather More than, activated. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I would say I am not over designing as much. Yeah, that's a really good point. Ashley, what about, what about you? Um, I kind of first learned about, you know, this in general with, um, Stu has had a um, segment on Susan Cain and how she had the quiet oh, spaces. Yes. That was kind of like a big start of like, we have this open office now. You know, everybody wants to open office, but what about the introverts of the group or the, the neurodivergent people mm -hmm. of the group um, or people who just need some quiet? Um, so providing these, you know, kind of more quiet spaces within these group, you know, or open office to get away and have that solitude or have that even private phone call. Um, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's really important to provide different environments for different types of work. And uh, you get kind of like, you can get pigeonholed and do, you know, everything's open, but yes. that's not, that's yeah. not a good solution. Or scare people with mm -hmm. the whole open office and they think about that when in reality we have found better ways because it's backed by science and all the stuff we're talking about today that we won't just put you on one big open room, we promise. But it's um, good for collaboration for yes. depending on the type of work you're doing. So there's the benefits to it. But. Yeah, I think, I think it was also a steel case white paper um, a while ago. I'm pretty sure it was post-COVID, but mm -hmm. not this year. Um, but it had 
had talked about the fact that when we did open the office up and we took away all of these walls, the productivity and collaboration soared. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. satisfaction plummeted. And the satisfaction plummeted in the fact that of privacy and acoustics. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So that really has driven the furniture industry mm -hmm. to really figure out ways that we can solve that problem without having to build back all of these walls. So I'm, I'm definitely in with you and with the prospect and refuge. So yes, choice and control is mm -hmm. all about being able to choose whether you're in one space or another. Um, and just having the, the, those spaces also have a, a different tactile and sensory feel. Mm -hmm. So with like, it can be paint, it can be a texture, but it also could be a really good use of lighting. Mm -hmm. So I think Absolutely. I feel like lighting has been my goal mm -hmm. <laughs> to figure out how to do that a little better, to be a little bit more flexible for all of the neurodivergent and neurodiverse people. Um, Especially but also if you engage circadian myself. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh. Circadian yeah. rhythm. Why like don't you come up right now to Alaska and experience our four <laughs> hours of daylight? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's, it, it messes with psyches. Oh, and I, Ashley and I were talking about this earlier mm -hmm. in the office of like just that light change she's because she just moved up. Yep, coming back mm -hmm. after being gone for five years. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, got to readjust to mm -hmm. the long mm -hmm. stretches. Darkness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, the darkness. Casey, what about uh, anything that you've expanded on or changed because of what you've learned? I don't know if I've, I've personally had the opportunity to... Um, to change and grow in the same way because I am a few years behind you guys um, just in like experience. Um, however, it has been something that I've always tried to think of and like is part of the reason I went into design in the first place. I'm like everyone deserves to have a space that feels good to them, um, whether or not it's always going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. If there's something yeah. about the space that feels good, no matter how you think or view the world, that was always kind of my, my MO of wanting to you know, mm -hmm. get into the field as it is. But, um, you know, I think it's something that we're learning to design for as a field, as an industry, as uh, education systems, as governments. Like, it's it's definitely something that people are still learning. I love mm -hmm. that they're still learning, too. It's not just like, nope, that's how it's been done forever. Don't touch it. Mm -hmm. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you know? <laughs> Until you use Give it. it a try. Um, and so... Bouncing off of what you said, is there a public space that you've seen be either like a really good success or a really big failure? I'm for ready. Someone? I'm going to steal this one In first. The, okay, go. you take it. Gyms. Gyms. They suck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, where do you work out? Uh, <laughs> like, you put them on blast because I'm curious. <laughs> everywhere, everywhere I've All ever gyms. walked into a gym. Like, listen up. <laughs> it's it's made for narcissistic males. I'm sorry. Like. Girl, I love mirrors too. Oh, okay, it's not about the mirrors. <laughs> it's about just so we're clarifying you know, what's narcissistic. It's not the mirrors. No, no, okay. no it's All not right. the mirrors. It's like yes, you need to check your form. There's technicalities of like being in a gym that you need certain things. However, it's. Uh, men are typically more competitive than women, so wear all the weights in the biggest room possible, mm -hmm. so that the men can basically compete against one another, and and that gets that's very intimidating for someone of a normal caliber let alone someone who's mildly neurodivergent and mm. uh i think that that's a space that has never been fully activated because it comes from gymnasiums and Gre greco-roman culture right which was male dominated mm. women that's were not true. allowed in gymnasiums i'm just thinking the acoustics i'm just on your band yeah. oh that too you know like yeah. oh it's the so clanging and like the like, overstimulating really, music yeah so or playing stressful. music that you don't like. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, just so then you pop in your headphones, but then someone's <laughs> like, hey, are you done with that? Hey, are you done with that? And that's uh, it pulls you out of your zone. And, you know, so I think that yes. gymnasiums are one of the most insensitively designed places that people frequent on a daily basis. And on that note, too, I want to add that you were saying um, almost neurodivergent. Neurodivergent also encompasses those with anxiety. Yeah depression mm -hmm. so it's it's not um just like adhd mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it's definitely a, a broader sense so those with anxiety in a gym i can definitely understand that pain mm -hmm. um ashley what about you do you have any success or failure stories um i would just say you know 
being sensitive, hypersensitive to my environment, being places that are so freaking loud. <laughs> like, oh, it's just, you know, bad acoustics, yes. bad lighting, you know, just the kind of the general vibe, using your five senses, go through a space and use your five senses. And if anything's getting overstimulated, you know, it's like, it, it's, you know, it, not good. Uh, Jim's Coming from a soccer mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sports event family. Right. Right. I can see where that could be a little bit excessive for noise control. Yeah. I'm, but I'm thinking like restaurants in particular. Oh my gosh. Not worst. even be able to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. That's hard. I'm like what? What are you saying? Yeah. I don't know how to respond to you because I can't hear you. Or you either. shut down from yeah. too much You're like, I'm just going to head nod at this point. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. And then go home <laughs> like, and take a nap. This, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. All right, Kara, what about you? Malls. Ooh. Mm. It's because it, there's some psychology behind malls. Yes. I don't know if you guys have ever, like, let yourself really dive into, like, they're mm. mapping us. Like, <laughs> the way they put stores next to other stores and the lighting change. Mm. They're trying to have unique experiences, like, back to back to back to mm. back. But yet you're in, like, this cattle corridor most of the time. <laughs> it's like Disney where you're, World. Where you're trying to avoid the middle because, like, that's the most aggressive socially. Seriously. You know, Do you want to try the sample? Right. Constant. Yeah. <laughs> but I would say Who that, thought that was a good it could idea? also be such a wonderful opportunity for people that, you know, have neurodiversity needs that it's like if it was categorized not on consumption which it will never not be about consumerism you know it's mm -hmm. but if a mall maybe took an opportunity on a revamp to put stores like each other next to each other mm -hmm. then all of a sudden the kid zone would be very well established mm -hmm. or you would start to establish like a a deeper experience which would be almost one that was sought after mm -hmm. you know it wouldn't be as sporadic it would allow people to like choose find their group better and, yeah. and what their what their comfort level not segregation wise but like between how people view you right. know need have different needs but in they i need to find my people mm -hmm. to feel safe and i also think malls it's like a dying culture and maybe it's because of gen my z is bringing it back gen man. z is bringing it back they because are here's the thing Hardcore. they are the og of the community center mm -hmm. you know and i feel like mm -hmm. they're especially in our arctic climate here it's just such a beautiful way to experience volume mm -hmm. and also be social. And there's just like a lot of ecosystem that you could learn about a society mm -hmm. if you have like a very well functioning mall. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm just bowling I, alleys, ice skating I mean, rings. Have you guys <laughs> seen the design for uh, this? Is a quick Alaska aside, but <laughs> uh, when they were trying to see if we should move our um, capital, which is Juneau, to Tell me Willow, it was not going to be at the Diamond. You know, it was going to be Willow, oh. Willow, and Alaska, Willow, what? Alaska. I uh, watched a whole documentary. They made like a documentary in the 1970s about there was four major firms that did it. And each one of them had a different idea. One was like an alpine ski village that you could like ski building to building. One was like very like Alaska, like in the 1970s. But, right. so, but the one that was very interesting was the most futuristic of the options. It was a giant mall. <laughs> Every like the whole town of Willow would have built, basically been under one roof. Can I just say right like now, Whittier. every building crazy. in Fairbanks, like the campus and our DOD facilities are all raising their hand right now. They're like, yo, we're like malls. You're we like, we like, did that. Because <laughs> it's corridors. negative 40 degrees. <laughs> I know. Anyway, but it was, yeah. the, it was to allow them to escape the environment <laughs> as well yeah. as create the most community that they, yeah. you know, you could get everywhere on a nice covered, warm Brit yeah, land bridge. That's definitely one way to definitely. Mm -hmm. And I guess just the community. last part of the mall soapbox mm -hmm. I would have would be I think it's important to say that there is difference, but not segregate. You yeah. know, and so that's why I'm like, oh, the mall, because <laughs> I'm just like, I'm wanting to find a typology where people can still be around people that aren't the same as them, because mm -hmm. our learning will stop if we segregate too much. You know, we don't want to mm -hmm. create these spaces that are like very typecasted. Mm -hmm. Because then I think, well, yeah, we'll stop learning. We'll stop flexing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And exploring, too. Yeah. When you're placed, you know, the shops are placed different than you can go and explore. It's like, oh, I might not have done that, you know, gone past that store because I was looking for the certain store and, you know, mm -hmm. sparks your curiosity. Mm -hmm. Stop in. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, um, I recently, I'm going to use an example from a recent trip that I had. Um, and it was... I, w I won't call out the airport because a lot of airports will function this way. 
But now that we've gotten rideshare <laughs> under our umbrella of options, mm-hmm. um, getting to rideshare from anywhere in an airport is so different anywhere you go that anybody that has any slight of um, uh, like just anxiety in general. I'm like, to- it's anxiety causing. Okay? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just... It needs it needs some help. So I think that is one that I can see can definitely benefit Mm -hmm. from some of these things. So on the topic of what we can do better or what we're doing good in public spaces, there was an article that um, another design firm that I will put all these in our our show notes, too, so you guys can have access to these. But they basically had a couple um, segments of what we could do to think about designing it a little bit better for all of neurodiverse and neurodivergent individuals. So the first one was stimulation versus naturalness. And I thought that was kind of cool that they used naturalness, Mm. not nature. (laughs) So we hear that all. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it was like, Really, for them, it seems it, they said it was like the most difficult elements for them to define because it was almost too simple, like stimulation, nature. But nature also has stimulation. Mm-hmm. So you're basically saying that there is always going to be um, a fine line of a balance between what we provide. And it kind of goes back to what you're saying, Kara, of choice and control. Mm-hmm. Right? If we provide the options to either be stimulated when you need to be stimulated or have naturalness when you need that respite and mm. that comfort. The next one um, was flexibility, adaptivity. Uh, <laughs> the next one was flexibility, adjustability, and opportunities for movement, which I thought mm-hmm. was really smart because that also goes back to the well mm-hmm. and furniture. Ashley, you want to talk more about like how that could be in furniture? Movement within furniture? Mm-hmm. Um, well, obviously, height adjustable. It's like That's like the first easy. thing. Yeah. yeah. So sit to stand desks. Um, and they make even like treadmill desks or those. I've seen the cycling ones too. So if you're looking for like physical exercise, they have those as well. But just even going from sit to stand is helpful. Yeah. So or they're wobble chairs. And oh, education. wobble chairs. Goodness. Yeah. The yeah. surfboard thing we have. That's <laughs> awesome. That's have you stood on it? Yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm into it. I thought it's it was funny. coffee. Because <laughs> Rob came around the corner, he was just using it as like when he was sitting and like a fidget foot fidget. Oh. And then he saw me standing on, he's like, Oh, you could stand. <laughs> I was like, Well, you could do either one. It's encouraging you to be creative. I um, have seen there on the subject of movement, there are things you can get off of Amazon that will hook onto airline seats that give your feet something to swing on for those who can't sit for long times on airplanes. And don't your kiddos have a really cool, I know that they're bigger oh. now, but when they are oh, no, little. We still use and them. Tr- yeah, so explain this. Oh, well, this is a great example. The whole thing into a couch. It's awesome. So it's like Ooh. a blow up shaped oh, in the space, so like between the chair. Uh-huh. And, and so they just lay out on like this bougie bed. <laughs> Mm. So on a seven hour flight, you're just looking over and they're like stretching. You're like, it's to be a child again. Yeah, (laughs) right. (laughs) I'm like, you can't wake up cranky. Okay. It's so funny. Yeah. All of these examples, they're basically just saying that you're, you're creating micro environments. Mm -hmm. So having that couch in a plane (laughs) is Mm -hmm. a great example or having one, um, focus room that has a walking treadmill so you can check it out and take your, your meeting while walking. You know, Mm -hmm. it's an option for you to do Um, or having a walking track built into your office. Just walk around your office, enjoy the views and talk to your coworker. So micro environments was the next one. And then the third one was supporting different levels of privacy Hmm. for social interactions, which I was like, okay, different levels of privacy in social interactions. And my mind immediately went to like your restaurant Mm -hmm. example. Right. There's a lot going on. It's very social, but you have different choices of where you can sit Mm -hmm. the booth, the center or what's ever left over, which sometimes, you know, like if they put you in the center of the room and it's empty, it feels a little weird, right? Mm hmm. But they like, put why you. Have I been yeah. <laughs> why? <laughs> why can't I have the corner? But if they put you in the center of the room and it's busy and activated, it does not feel weird. So it's kind of also your how social 
the location is. They put you right next to the door and you're like, thank you. I like to be facing That's, the door for yeah. safety yeah. issues. <laughs> it's, or if it's cold, <laughs> then it's, you're like forgetting oh, to breeze yes. all the time. Yep. Yep. If you're Little by things. a window mm-hmm. or any of the HVAC units. Mm-hmm. The yeah. fans on, you're like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So creating an environment that caters to multiple different types of activities in that social hub. Um, the last one or the second to last one was uh, to simplify wayfinding. It's like, yeah, that's mm-hmm. definitely. It's like your airport I example of finding the, the ride, ride share. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it also nods to like universal design, right? Mm-hmm. It's a lot of. Yeah, um, multicultural. Like multicultural. There's symbols for a reason. Yes. And having our pictograms, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, there's not just words in a language. There's pictures, there's colors, mm-hmm. there's body language. There's a lot of things that can happen. Um, even lighting levels. You know, to direct your eye one way or don't look down here. It's dark and gloomy. <laughs> like, just direct <laughs> yourself to the bright lights shining above. Um, but I thought that was a really great one to tie back to the fact that universal design is designing for all of these as well. Mm-hmm. So we have been slightly doing this for, for a while. And the last one was to have a larger focus on specifically enhancing universal design. So looking at ways of designing that's not like too limiting um and that might be an an example would be like we have an ada height countertop how many of us fit an ada height countertop i do not i am too tall (laughs) i just looked right at you yeah thank you so it's like okay well how can we design this location to accommodate multiple different sizes not just those in a wheelchair And those in a wheelchair that are six foot males. Mm. That was the other thing. It's like universal design had started with our veterans Mm -hmm. um, coming out of our world wars that typically were six feet and male. So a lot of these were designed to to accommodate them. And there's more individuals now that need to have more promoted comfort Mm -hmm. (laughs) than back in our world war days. Mm -hmm. Knock on wood. Um, so with those five sections of options for improvement, do you, is there like one thing that like sparks out and you're like, oh, yes, I'm going to do that tomorrow. Or I just did that. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm going to dive right in here. It, it kind of makes me a little, a little mad that we have to say this. Ah, uh, yeah. Because I'm like, I don't care how neurodivergent you are or how non-neurodivergent you are. There are some things that are sensible and good practices in design mm-hmm, period. Mm-hmm. Hence universal design, making it accessible for everyone. I don't think that it's, um, we're, we're getting past antiquated. However, we're still antiquated in the fact that we have to put a label to it. I was like, that's, that's not the point. If, if you're creating a space that invites everyone and everything, shouldn't it be second nature to think about those people who view the world as a, as my mom always says, as a heads up display versus a topographical map. Mm -hmm. Like think about the way that we do wayfinding. It doesn't matter how you associate the way you think Mm. or the way you process. The world should be open to you no matter what. I agree completely. Cheers. (laughs) Drink more wine. Can you repeat the five? Yeah, so overall summary is the stimulation and naturalness. Mm -hmm. Then we have flexibility, adjustability, and opportunities for movement. Then we have supporting different levels of privacy in social situations, Mm -hmm. simplifying wayfinding, and then larger focus on universal design enhancements. Um, The naturalness really hit me Mm -hmm. because I feel like because we can, we do a lot with technology and in our profession a lot, you know, it's hard not to do the shiny thing, but I mean, it's as simple as having an operable window. So Mm. there's airflow or a personal fan or a task light. I mean, these don't have to be crazy moments that help neurodivergent people feel more at ease and comforted. Um, And so I guess it's kind of more the same of what I said to, I used to be, highly detailed, which felt 
maybe more narcissistic yeah. in my earlier days. Like I know exactly how big of a book, it, like all the you tiny did. things, you know, I knew exactly <laughs> you knew what that. you needed. Mm -hmm. And now it's like creating space that could become so many different mm -hmm. things and keeping it to a natural texture. I think mm -hmm. it might freak people out if they were to touch something and this feels like plastic instead of wood. Yeah. So I think there's um, very certain things we could just be um, humble and mm -hmm. like, kind of purists about yeah, what we're doing. Yeah, the tactile is important. Mm -hmm. So you pick up something you think looks like wood and it's not heavy enough. Right. Mm -hmm. It's disappointing. It's yeah. Well, it's not even, it's it's unnerving, like Kara mm -hmm. said. It's like a mind puzzle. It's like, yeah. I, what? This isn't <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Yeah, it doesn't Computing. feel right. Mm -hmm. Like the loading screen in your brain. <laughs> 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 what is this? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, Ashley, do you got any closing thoughts on that? Um, I think the flexibility piece um, is is kind of real hot right, hot topic right now anyway in a lot of the you know designs we're doing um, to you know extend the life of that space too if you leave it more open you can do a lot more things with it and accommodate a lot um, broader of a group of people you know it's not it's hard to do a one size fits all that really doesn't exist so being able to flex the space and create different things is yeah you know, pretty that's important. Really important. And I'm going to take a 180 degree spin here because researching the neurodivergence, you're finding people like Thomas Edison, who we had talked about on a previous well, podcast, right. and Albert Einstein and Henry Ford and all these really monumental people in our history. And I was like, how how can I learn from them? you know, like <laughs> reverse the, almost the conversation. And so there was kind of a cool little article on individual adjustments that we can do to be more detail oriented mm -hmm. and better at math and time management and everything. So I wanted to leave everybody with a couple personal things that we can do to be more like Mr. Edison and Albert and Ford. And some of those are, if you are working in an open space, just choose the low traffic area if you get distracted. Like, that's simple to ask. Like, you can't control your environment sometimes. We're, we're helping you to give you that autonomy and choice and control, but that's not going to happen everywhere, mm -hmm. even in a restaurant, right? You want to, I want to be in the corner booth, please. Just, just ask. Um, and then other things like visual checklists. Um, I think Scrum was a really good mm -hmm. um, uh, process of managing a team that had a lot of different colors and sticky notes and ways to process information from one group to another. And that was a really great example of how that brain worked, which mm -hmm. I thought was really interesting because that's data minded. Mm -hmm. um, another one would be breaking tasks up into like manageable pieces because a lot of us, <laughs> my hands raised, uh, <laughs> get overwhelmed potentially with like one big ask that I almost have to like take the deep breath and go, okay, well to get there, there's the goal where the sub goals. So mm -hmm. just being mm -hmm. able to, to break down the barrier to the thought process of getting there. How do you eat an elephant? Ah, yes. How to eat one an elephant. One bite at a time. Yeah. And another one that I just tried <laughs> that I'm actually really excited to share with you is setting an alarm for like hyper-focus time mm. versus non-hyper-focus <laughs> time. Yes. And it was amazing how much I got done. It mm -hmm. was like, 30 minutes of focus, 20 minutes of non-focus. And he's like, wow, that's like only 10 minute difference there. I got so much more done probably than trying to focus for an hour. Interesting. Hmm. So it was setting a timer on my phone. This doesn't have to be your phone, but setting a timer for um, anywhere between 20 and 45 minutes was the study to focus on something. And you just can't do anything else but what? you told yourself to focus on, unless you're done, of course. If you finish the task, yeah, congratulations, that's awesome. Um, but you cannot break until that alarm goes off. And when the alarm goes off, you cannot start anything else work-related for another 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And work-related meaning like brain, like I need my brain. I could clean at my desk. I could put the library materials away. There's many things I could do, but taking that 20 minutes to almost do the overhead things versus mm -hmm. the work so it's kind of like those two buckets. Um, and it, like I said, it was pretty amazing what, uh, what I got done. So I wanted to share those um, tips with everybody. Uh, and again, I will put all of these links in our show notes because there's a lot of really great information um, from a lot of different uh, 
design companies, universities. Um, a lot of people are focusing on neurodiversity, and I'm excited to uh, talk more intently and deeply about it in education and yeah, transportation yeah. and healthcare. So until then, we will sign off. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Complementary Colors is a production of MCG Explore Design, an architecture and interior design firm located in beautiful Anchorage, Alaska. If you'd like to hear more future episodes, be sure to subscribe to Complementary Colors wherever you find podcasts.